Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the Bending the Climate Curve lecture series and this special uh, edition. Uh, we're excited to have you here and excited for our panelists uh, who are going to be busting uh, some myths or not uh, this morning. And so this is uh, an AIA registered course. Uh, Jennebeth will say more about that in a moment. Uh, and I'm excited uh, for that that for this Bending the Climate Curve lecture, uh, we partnered with the Healthcare Facilities Symposium and Expo, uh, and I'll turn it over to Jennebeth to share more. Jennebeth. Great, thank you, Troy. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Jennebeth Ferguson with the Healthcare Facilities Symposium and Expo. We're really excited to be partnering with Mazzetti on this morning's webinar. I think you're all gonna enjoy the format and the benefit of our two organizations um, working together. Um, this is part of the webinar series for the Healthcare Facility Symposium that we do throughout the year, but our primary um, focus is our main in-person event, which will be this September in Austin, Texas, and we look forward to seeing a lot of you there. Um, as Tori mentioned, I'm going to do the housekeeping on the subject of the AIA accreditation. This course um, does receive one learning unit. Most of you would have provided your AIA number during registration. If for some reason you did not, um, please respond to the registration email with your AA number by the end of this week, and we will be submitting um, all of those credits. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Troy. Great. Thank you so much, Genevieve. This particular webinar came about because of a conversation Genevieve and I had about decarb healthcare. Some of you participated in the decarb healthcare workshops uh, in 2021 and 2022. Uh, if you didn't, I wanted to let you know that the format of a decarb healthcare uh, workshop is meant to be a little bit interactive. Uh, and so we'll do a little bit of that today via polling. Uh, so we hope you have an amazing time. We'd also like to point out that decarb healthcare is there up and running today. And it's a place that you can go to help decarbonize your healthcare facility um, or to help uh, your clients or your friends decarbonize their healthcare facility. Uh, and so the hope is uh, that you will go to Decarb Healthcare and use many of the wonderful resources that are, that are there to help you decarbonize. Uh, at the end of our time, uh, you'll have an opportunity to see more features of Decarb Healthcare. This here is an image of the first page. Uh, again, uh, it's decarbhealthcare.com, a free tool that you can use uh, in order to get information on decarbonizing healthcare, um, as well as to share uh, information with colleagues and friends on the site. All right, we're getting ready to go. Uh, we're using a Mythbusters format, which we were excited about today. Uh, and so our first speaker is going to be Jim Crabb. To introduce Jim, uh, we are going to start by doing a poll. So here's how this is going to work. On your screen, you should see uh, a question number one, which says, which one of these isn't quite right? Uh, there's three items about Jim. One of them isn't quite right. You get to choose which one you think it is. Uh, and then Jim will answer in a moment. And then secondly, there's a question uh, or a statement rather. that says, my hospital's electrical system can't handle it. The grid can't handle it. That's why we shouldn't electrify. So you can go ahead and choose whether you think that is true uh, or myth. So five is closest to true, zero is closest to myth, and we recognize that there's a continuum on this, perhaps, uh, at least before you hear Jim's presentation, uh, and so that's why this is uh, a scale. Uh, and so if you only see two questions on your screen, you should scroll down. There is a third question. All right, those responses are coming in. We'll give it another couple of seconds, uh, and then we'll turn it over to Jim. Wow, interesting. I'm going to show you the results in just a moment. Uh, but audience, you will be surprised uh, by the results to question number one. All right, it looks like most of you have selected an answer. I'm going to share the results here. Uh, and so you should be able to scroll up and down to see uh, the results. Uh, Jim, in a moment, will tell you which one of those uh, one of those statements isn't quite right. All right, I'm going to stop sharing the, the poll uh, and turn it over to Jim. 
Jim, go ahead. Well, um, so as far as the uh, the questions about myself, when I started at Georgia Tech, um, we were taught this, and and no self respecting Georgia Tech graduate would ever say that we were the the MIT of the South. We were taught that uh, MIT was the Georgia Tech of the North, uh, with some seriousness, I think. Uh, but regardless, uh, let's move on to the uh, the real point of this uh, presentation, which is uh, which is the questions about electrification. So before we can really talk about how to electrify a hospital. Um, we need to talk about how energy flows in a hospital. And so if you think about it, there are really two ways that, that energy really enters, large quantities of energy enter a hospital, electricity and natural gas or methane. Uh, of course, we have sunshine, we've got skin loads that uh, might be a gain or a loss. Um, but um, we're looking at this in terms of a winter kind of a cold weather profile. So uh, skin loads are a loss. But the thing to think about really with electricity is that all of that electricity, all that electrical energy that comes into our building really becomes heat inside our buildings. We know about this in data centers. We talk about that all the time. We talk about KW as uh, of the rack and that's all heat. We don't think about that necessarily in the rest of our buildings, but that's just how it works. All that energy becomes heat. Of course, we also have heat from human beings inside the building. Um, and then all that heat that comes in in, uh, in form of methane that be, maybe go to a steam, fire, uh, steam or a hot water boiler, that also becomes heat in our building. That's a little more obvious. But reheat is one we think about as being a waste of energy because we've cooled the, the air and now we're gonna reheat it again. But it's also important to realize, and Troy, the screen just changed to your outlook. Um, it's also important to realize that, that reheat is also a heating load uh, added to the building that then has to be cooled again through our heating system um, or the cooling system. So the main way that heat comes out of our building is through the cooling system. Uh, mostly it goes out through a cooling tower, which re just rejects that heat to the atmosphere. Um, our mechanical systems are also ventilating the building, and so the exhaust fans of that mechanical system are discharging heat. But some of you, the engineers in the, in the audience are thinking, oh, but wait, in the winter, I don't use a cooling tower. I don't run my chiller. I use free cooling. Next slide, Troy. So let's think about what free cooling means. Free cooling means we're bringing in outside air to remove all that heat from our building. But what are we doing with all that heat in our building? We're just using exhaust fans to, re to reject it to the atmosphere. We're throwing it away. We're wasting all that heat that we have in our building. And of course, everything else just keeps chugging along. We're proud of ourselves for our free cooling. And yes, it is free, but we're throwing away an awful lot of heat. So what we want to start thinking about is how do we use that heat? Think of it as a valuable resource rather than a waste product. Next slide. So in a, in a system where we use heat recovery, we're, we're able to capture that heat and reuse it. So in an electrified building, we wouldn't have that, that hot water boiler. We might still have a steam boiler, or we might use electricity for steam. Um, but all that power that goes into our building through the electricity, now we're recapturing that through a heat recovery chiller that makes hot water and sends it right back. And we can do all of our reheating, preheating, and domestic hot water using recovered energy rather than burning gas to make new energy. And of course, an important part of that also, particularly in the colder climates or the hot and humid climates like where I live in Atlanta, um, is to recover energy from the exhaust. And uh, that can significantly reduce the, the load of ventilation. So when we talk about a heat recovery chiller, next slide, Troy, um, we're talking about moving heat. A heat recovery chiller is a form of a heat pump and uh, the typical COP of a heat pump, which is basically the ratio of how much heat we get out to the energy we put into it is about 3.3. So we put in one BTU, wrong units, but BTU of electrical energy, and we get about 3.3 BTUs of heat out. 
that heat has to come from somewhere. We're not manufacturing heat, but we are moving that heat much more efficiently than a boiler, which is only about 80% 80, 80 efficient, a COP equivalent to 0.8. So a heat pump is really using about 75% less energy than a gas boiler to produce the same amount of heat. So let's think about that in terms of cost. Next. So I'm just using national averages here. Your mileage will vary because electric and gas rates do vary wildly across the country, but national averages reported by the Energy Information Administration. Electricity costs about 3.7 3 times the cost of gas, but because of the COP and the inefficiency of boilers, heating with a heat pump actually costs about 10% less than heating with a gas boiler. Again, national average. If your electricity rates are higher, it won't be quite that good. If your electricity rates are lower, then it's even better. But the point is that it's not really a huge difference. So the same amount of heat coming from a heat pump um, either costs a little bit less or a little bit more or about the same as using a gas boiler. So, okay, next, next slide, Troy. So then the other question would be, how much can our hospitals, can our hospital infrastructure and the grid support doing everything with electricity? Well, if all we did was convert a gas boiler to an electric boiler, the answer would probably be no. But because of the COP value of heat pumps, uh, it's, it's a different, different answer. Looking at typical hospital electrical system design, we see some variation of, uh, of the power infrastructure, but it's somewhere around 15 to 25, maybe even 30 watts per square foot, depending on the jurisdiction and some of the rules. Uh, but we've got a hospital here in Georgia that is all electric except for the kitchen, and it's only running actual measured load about 6.3 watts per square foot. So that would tell me that all electric can be at even can fit within the infrastructure that we typically design in a hospital. Well, so now you're thinking, well, in Georgia, sure, but up in the north where it's cold, that might be different. So we looked at a project um, up in in the northwest in, in Massachusetts that we've seen plans for, uh, not actually our design. Next slide, Troy. And in that hospital. That hospital has seven chillers at a thousand tons each. Uh, that takes roughly almost 6,000 kW of energy. They also have hot water boilers that provide all the heating. This, do this doesn't account for steam, but all the heating uh, that puts out about uh, 28,000 MBH or 8,200 kW through the magic of a heat pump COP, it would only take about 2,500 kW to produce the same amount of heat as all of those boilers. So about half as much power as the chillers are taking. And the point of that is if we have enough electrical infrastructure to power those chillers, we have enough electrical infrastructure to power heat pumps, heat recovery chillers to do the same work. Now, you still have to have a source for heat. Heat pumps have to move heat. They can't make heat. So there's uh, there are other issues here, but generally speaking, if we can find a source of heat, we can drive those heat pumps with the equipment, with the electrical infrastructure that we already have in place. Next. So just a quick review, our, uh, the first myth, electricity is too expensive. Um, my calculations say electricity is maybe a little less expensive, maybe a little bit more, but it's not a big difference. So I'm gonna call that myth busted. Second, the electrical infrastructure can't support electric heat. Well, if we've got enough power to support our chillers, we probably have enough power to support heat recovery chillers and even heat pumps, as long as we have a source for those heat pumps to, to move heat from. I'm gonna call that myth busted as well. So despite the sort of cheesy format there, uh, I was a big fan of Mythbusters show with my, with my young son. Um, obviously there are there are specific circumstances in any hospital where it, it might not work quite that well, but overall, big picture, we have the power and it isn't gonna cost much, if any more, 
to do it with electric heat. Excellent, Jim, thank you for that rousing discussion and for uh, busting some myths. I am sure you have questions for Jim, questions, answers, arguments. Uh, if you do, you can put them in the question and answer. Uh, we'll have a robust question and answer at the end with the time we have uh, remaining. Next up, we have Walt Vernon. Uh, by way of introduction, once again, we're going to do uh, a poll. Uh, and then Walt's two statements to, uh, to bust or prove true. Statement number one for Walt, the grid is dirty. Electrification will make carbon emissions worse. And statement number two, buying renewable energy doesn't make a difference since my power is actually still coming from the same coal or natural gas power plant. So in a moment, you will see uh, Walt's poll on your screen. Uh, and remember, uh, you may need to scroll down to get to all of the answers. Uh, and with Walt's poll, there is a bonus question in there, you'll uh, you'll you will see it. Uh, it's question number four. All right, answers are starting to come in. Oh, very nice. Many of you were able to find out the statement that wasn't quite right. Good job. All right, we will give it just another second. It looks like most people have gotten their responses in. All right, just another second and we're going to end the poll. Looks like folks are getting to that last question. Here we go. Okay. And so let's take a look at the results. Perfect. So the majority thought um, that Walt did not co-chair the Magenta book. Uh, we'll hear from Walt in just a moment as he turns on his video camera, and he'll tell us uh, which one of those statements is not quite correct. All right, Walt, the floor is yours. Thank you, Troy. Hopefully you all can hear me. The um, It was the white book that I chaired, not the magenta book, but it was the standard, and I did, I think, two or three editions of it. So thank you for that. Um, all right, so what I want to talk about a little bit is, uh, you know, one of the things we hear around the electrification question is the idea that, hey, look, the electrical grid is dirty. And so it's, in terms of emissions, I am better off to burn natural gas on site instead of, ha whether in a boiler or in a cogeneration unit than I am in buying electricity from the grid. And so, um, you know, as with all things, there, there's a lot of truth in that, but, you know, that particular argument rests on a set of assumptions that I think are maybe shaky. Uh, and I think there's a strong argument for moving to electrification, even um, in the face of, uh, sort of quasi-truth of, of those assumptions. The assumptions really are that the grid is static first. So whatever it is today, it's going to be that way forever and ever, amen. Second, that the issue of average emissions rather than marginal emissions is uh, the way I need to be thinking about this question. Third, that uh, the way I procure the electricity is really from the grid. Um, and maybe fourth, that there aren't opportunities to do things on site that will help. So let me just sort of jump into um, uh, 
a little bit of thinking on all four of these assumptions. Troy, I think you're controlling the uh, slides. So why don't we go to the next one? Um, this image shows uh, how the grid has evolved over the last 70 years. And uh, you can see that starting in the 2000s and driving towards 2021, our grid has become remarkably uh, more renewable and less emissive, in particular as coal uh, combustion has uh, declined and natural gas combustion increased. Um, it, it is a little ironic. I talked to a lot of folks who said, oh my gosh, you know, we've been pushing, pushing, pushing natural gas as being so much cleaner than coal, which it is. Uh, however, it's not zero. And so the push now is to move away from both, in a way, natural gas and coal, which is not trivial. Um, let's go to the next slide, Troy. Uh, and, and one of the issues, of course, when we talk about the grid is that there isn't a the grid. You know, our, our electrical distribution system and transmission system in this country is really fragmented. And, and you may hear a lot about transmission and transmission in some ways is our, is our biggest challenge in electrifying and, and moving the, the country's electrical consumption, I guess I would say, towards renewable electricity. And, and place matters. Um, this diagram shows the relative greenness of uh, electricity that can be procured in various locations um, based on different sources. And so where you are matters greatly in this conversation, of course. And if we go to the next slide, Troy, um, the next slide sort of shows how our trajectory has been and what a business as usual case looks like for emissions. And so truly uh, the assumption that the grid is fixed may well be true if we follow a business as usual trajectory. However, as we all know, a lot of money and uh, has, is being put into the greening of the grid through the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, uh, through other regulatory pressures, through the IRA. If you go to the next slide, um, you, it, it gives a sense of what will be required for us in terms of expansion on the far left is kind of where we are today for the relative fuel mixes. It sort of picks up on that first slide I show and shows where we need to go in terms of generation capacity. A added to that, of course, is the need for storage because many of these are intermittent and transmission. So it is a it is a huge challenge, uh, but much work is happening now and we are on a trajectory to, for the grid to become better. Now, I will say, this is not a political speech, but that trajectory could well be impacted by what happens on November the 5th, I think, of 2024. So I guess we have to stay tuned to see kind of which direction the grid is going to move. Next slide. Um, I, I do want to talk for a second about the issue of stranded assets. Um, and this is one of the things that I worry about. And, and as we design buildings here at Mazzetti, you know, I, I think about every boiler that we put in today wants to be depreciated over its lifetime. And there will become an economic argument to keep that thing in place for the next 30 years, even if the grid gets greener and my procurement options get greener. And so one of the serious issues around installing natural gas fired equipment now, combustion equipment on site is that it locks us in to a future of continued emissions for the life of those assets, rather than being able to track to improving procurement options and improving grid. Next slide. Um, uh, I think I wanna, uh, what, what I wanna talk about for a second is the issue of average emissions for a grid versus marginal emissions for a grid. This is something that um, is addressed in the upcoming, I don't think we do that on the DCARB website, but I know the ASHRAE DCARB guide that we're gonna talk about addresses this issue a little bit. And, and, and the question of marginal emissions has to do with the fact that when you consume load, drives the actual fuel mix of the utility at that particular point in time. And so um, 
at different times of day, uh, the grid might be dirtier or cleaner and how your systems are interacting with that makes a difference. Um, in general, because the renewable assets are less expensive to operate, they tend to be the ones that operate all the time. And as load goes up on a system, the other dirtier systems begin to produce. And so to the degree that we can keep load off of uh, the grid um, altogether, that certainly helps. Um, but when we're thinking about the emissions that we're generating on site, it's not simply a question of the average emission. It is a question of what we're doing versus what the marginal impact of a different source on the grid might be, all of which probably sounds very complicated, but it, it's sort of um, important to think about how you design your energy systems in conjunction with what the grid is doing because it is not a static thing. Next slide, Troy. Uh, I did want to talk for a second about procurement because uh, the grid is not often our only procurement option. And even when it is, there may be options within the grid. Um, and, and I think that's really instructive. I, I Some of you have heard Eric Berzon from Kaiser Permanente talk. Um, and, you know, many of us, many of us have said through the years, well, one of the economic problems with energy efficiency is energy only consumes 1% of a healthcare institution's budget. So saving a little bit of energy is such a trivial amount of money that no healthcare CFO is interested in it, which it could be true. Eric flips that on its head, that argument, and says, well, look, if energy is only 1% of uh, uh, a hospital's budget and I can spend 10% more and get 100% clean electricity, clean energy, it doesn't matter. And we ought to do that because of the health benefits and the, the other PR benefits. And I think that's really an interesting argument. And I do think, uh, I, I, you know, it used to be when we were designing electrical systems, the utility was it. And our job was to figure out which light bulb to purchase because the first cost versus ongoing costs, that was the only decision. But now we have the ability to design our systems in the context of the way we're going to design our procurement strategies. And if we think about procurement in isolation of design or design in isolation of procurement, we do a disservice to the hospital. And, and really those two things uh, need to be thought of in conjunction with one another to best, uh, and, and of course, both of those are moving targets. Um, and so we've got to think about those as both as dynamic systems that are interrelating all the time, which makes it far harder in some ways to design perfect systems. Um, next slide. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit is on-site renewables. Many of you have heard of the Valley Children story by now. Uh, and in some ways, they're a little bit of an outlier because they happen to have all of this agricultural land sitting fallow all around them. But <clears throat> Valley Children's Hospital is, is putting this microgrid onto their site, which will reduce their carbon footprint approximately 50% from what it has been. And they will do it. They are using fuel cells, which will consume methane. So they're not perfectly emission-free, but they are vastly better than what they were before because their pre previous procurement had been from a real, they, they were using um, distributed access and they were using the local utility for transmission, but they were buying electricity from Calpine and to get the cheapest possible electricity, they were getting uh, coal fired power. Now they will be generating power on site um, using sort of a, a, a methane cogen system and the PV and really importantly, storage to better balance the loads uh, and the load system. So I, I, I give this example only to show that, you know, people will say rural hospitals can't do it. A, a, a safety net hospitals can't do it. Public pay hospitals can't do it. Well, this hospital's all three, a rural public pay essential hospital, and they're doing it and they're saving money by doing it. And if they can do it, for heaven's sakes, I think the rest of us can figure out ways to do it as well. So um, I guess I didn't put a busted sign up, but I do think uh, that thinking that we need to install combustion on site because the grid is dirty, it, 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 it is at least too simplistic an answer. And in my view, a very short-sighted 
answer that will not serve us, any of us well in the long run. So Troy, back to you. Great, excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, for that rousing presentation. Uh, I am sure that you will have questions, uh, answers, arguments uh, for Walt. If you do, you can put them in the Q&A. Uh, we'll have a chance to uh, take a look at them uh, after our next presentation. I'm excited now to introduce Heather Burpee. Uh, we're going to once again introduce her by way of poll. And so in a moment, you will see a poll on your, on your screen. Heather will be tackling the statements, uh, clients will never support electrification, uh, and electrification will make it difficult to design beautiful healing spaces. And then you can try and figure out which one of Heather's statements isn't quite right. Great answers are coming in. Oh, it looks like we have a couple more answers coming in. We'll end the poll in just uh, a moment. Uh, two of the answers to Heather's statements are looking quite even. It should be interesting to hear what the real answer is. All right, it looks like we've settled down on the poll. We're going to end the poll and share the results. So again, you can scroll down if necessary <laughs> on your screen to see the results. All right, and Heather, I'll turn it over to you. Perfect, thank you, Troy. So yeah, you can see those results. The first question there was a little bit of a rogue to throw people off, but I am, am now at the University of Washington at the Integrated Design Lab and um, faculty in the Department of Architecture. And I've been at UW for um, approaching 20 years. So um, it's actually the middle question that is the, half truth. And um, I spent the first part of my career, um, I studied biology and worked in a couple different capacities in molecular biology and drug discovery, and then transitioned to architecture. So I've been following the trajectory of research. Um, it started in the sciences, and now I'm um, doing architectural research and, um, and faculty. So um, it's great to be here. So the questions that I am um, busting, and I like to see your poll results. I think this was the clearest outlay of the poll results where um, the first question is clients will never support electrification. And it's heartening to see that um, the majority of poll takers say um, that's not true. And I think that's what we're seeing in the market that more and more um, clients are interested in electrification, decarbonization, and energy reduction. And it's for various reasons, you know, motivations vary. And um, the national cultural climate is variable and the um, reasons for electrifying and decarbonizing may vary also. Um, as, you know, customer demand might um, dictate and competitive marketplace, may be a reason why hospitals are opting towards uh, these greener solutions. And it may be seen as good business. And, you know, Walt talked about it earlier about Kaiser deciding to invest in, um, in cleaner grid solutions and decarbonization. So absolutely people are choosing to do, to do this. It's also becoming our um, regulatory um, standard. So um, depending on where you are and where your clients are, um, codes and standards are shifting and changing. I'm in Washington state in the city of Seattle and 
our energy codes are very, very stringent. So they're driving towards full electrification for all sources of heat, including um, heating for space, for water, and for everything. Um, and so depending on what municipality your client is in, they may be headed in that direction as well. We also have um, what are called building performance standards or BPS, which are a way to reduce energy and carbon emissions from a stand from a state or city standard standpoint, or even a campus standard. Um, so the, some of these are, are fuel blind. So they're based on total energy consumption and some of them are based on emissions. So it just depends. Um, this is these, this is an infographic and statistics from the um, Institute for Market Transformation and indicating that more than 600 U.S. governments have included some kind of G greenhouse gas reduction target. Um, so this is happening. And so clients are going to be interested in making sure their buildings are meeting these standards. Let's go to the next slide. And um, to the point that Walt made, you know, these standards are, are coming, and um, this is a map sh uh, that shows the U.S. and where building performance standards have been adopted by states and cities. And the uh, green is indicating that they're already in place, and blue is indicating that they're com they're forthcoming. And you know, to to Walt's point about stranded assets, um, thinking about building performance standards and designing to a level where buildings will conform with these standards 10, 20, 30 years from now well, is a really important thing for design teams to take on, to make sure that they're not designing a building that's going to be outmoded or incur fines because of these standards that are being put in place. So myth busted, clients will never support electrification. I think it's happening and um, it's happening fairly rapidly. So on to the next myth, um, ele electrification will make it difficult to de design beautiful healing spaces. So um, putting my architect hat on, and I think there are probably a lot of architects in the audience, um, a beautiful design, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I think as architects, we all think we're, aiming to design beautiful buildings. And in order to make an energy efficient electrified hospital that meet the demands that Walt and Jim outlined, we need to start with passive design strategies or really design for climate. Know where the place is that we're designing for and match the design to that climate, both from uh, environmental climate, but also cultural climate. And reducing envelope loads is the first place to start with that. And from my perspective, um, bioclimactic design and place-based design is beautiful design, right? You're matching the needs of your client, your the 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 the, the people that are going to be coming to the building, and also um, decarbonizing and making it more energy efficient. We also, this list of things that are on the screen here are things that we know that will reduce the loads in a building, which will lead to the ability to electrify and decarbonize. And some of these are visible. So, um, you know, passive design strategies and building envelope improvements to my point of bioclimactic design. We can see those, we can design well with those, we can create beautiful buildings using those strategies. Some of the other strategies may be less visible, but also contribute to the um, electrification, decarbonization, energy efficiency. Still others, for example, the, the last three on this list, decoupling heating and cooling and ventilation, displacement ventilation and other strategies actually improve indoor air quality and create a more comfortable environment for the people that inhabit the spaces. And so, in thinking about decarbonization, electrification, energy efficiency, I'm kind of grouping those all together. Um, we actually are improving the, the quality of the healing spaces that we're designing. So creating even better spaces than we would have, which is 
um, really fantastic to be able to pair those things together, right? That um, energy efficiency or decarbonization doesn't come at the expense of beauty or, or high quality or healing. Let's go to the next slide. I just want to show an example of this. Um, this is an example that is in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And um, the, I like this headline that St. Michael's Medical Center embraces its Northwest setting. So again, thinking about the climate that's here. And this climate is you know, fairly North in latitude. And um, is if you were looking behind the camera, you would see a view of the Puget Sound with the Olympic Mountains in the background an epically beautiful view facing west, which in these northern latitudes, west facing glass facades are hugely energy intensive and difficult to manage the loads. And I show this example because it was one where um, deep quantitative analysis was used to design this facade to reduce those loads. And you can see that there are horiz horizontal shading devices that act as the first stage of the cooling system, really, making sure that that direct sun, that Western sun is not coming into that Western lobby when it's especially hot. And so the size of the systems were massively reduced and um, were much more energy efficient because the facade was really thoughtfully designed with the climate. And I would say, I think this is a beautiful example. So myth busted, electrification will make it design, difficult to design beautiful healing spaces. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Heather. Great job. Uh, Heather gave us a lot of food for thought. Uh, if you have questions, comments, uh, objections, go ahead and write them in the Q&A and we'll address as many as we can. All right, so we did a poll at, at the beginning of each of our STEAM panelists' uh, discussions. Uh, we are going to do another poll at the end. Uh, the questions are the same. Uh, so we want to now see uh, if you still feel the same way about the myths. Uh, there's also space in this poll for you to uh, indicate uh, a bullet or two on your thinking. Uh, this poll is uh, a little bit longer, um, but go ahead and uh, and jump in. All right, answers are coming in. It looks like our panelists missed uh, or convinced a lot of people that some of these statements were myth if you look at it the right way. Interesting. Great job, everybody. It looks like the answers are starting to uh, slow down. Uh, so we will end the poll in just a moment. Right, we see one or two more answers coming. All right, thank you. All right. And for those who participated in this one, here are the results. You can scroll down to see all of the results. 
on your page. Yeah. Well, thank you. We have a few minutes left. Uh, I am excited uh, to uh, have an opportunity to show you a little bit more of Decarb Healthcare, uh, a website that you can go to to get uh, support in your hospital or hospital partner's decarbonization journey uh, and to help bust myths. Uh, and I'm excited to introduce Austin Berlin, who's going to give us a very quick demo of Decarb Healthcare, uh, and then we'll go to question and answers. Austin? Thanks, Troy. Pull up Decarb Healthcare. So, um, Troy shared the landing page of Decarb Healthcare. Uh, hopefully, all of you have seen it. Uh, if you haven't, I'll do a quick uh, tour for you. So, you'll come to the landing page, um, and I encourage you to create an account and log in. Um, it's a passwordless uh, login. So, um, no need to remember any passwords. Um, but when you come to the, the guidebook and when you are logged in, there's a, a better experience. You're able to uh, access the conversations and, and um, topics that people are talking about uh, in, in within the different sections. Um, but I want to mainly direct attention to this guidebook tab where you'll find the, the heart of the content within the guidebook. Um, and this green bar on your on the left side of your screen will serve as the menu for all the different content. Um, and so start out with some welcome and kind of setting the stage for why, why we need to decarbonize. Um, and then there's a sections on approach, uh, breaking down the steps to decarbonization um, and some differences between new construction or uh, uh, existing buildings and some financing um, financing decarbonization strategies. Um, we have a section that looks into benchmarking uh, hospitals and specifically uh, as well as different building codes and design standards from around the country. Um, and these are being updated uh, uh, to add new ones as, as new uh, building performance standards come out. Uh, so we, we are adding those regularly. Um, and then down into these technology sections uh, is really the, the meat of the, the, the heart of the content. And a lot of the, um, the, the fundamental concepts behind decarbonization in healthcare. So um, these are all strategies, th these different technologies or strategies. Uh, and we share case studies, um, executive summary, which you can read on all of these quickly. Uh, and then you can dive into some, some interesting case studies and data where we have it available. Um, we also have uh, information on um, different motivate, different ways of motivating your organization uh, or the, the um, industry to decarbonize. So there's, there's different strategies and, and, um, commentary on motivation, <clears throat> and then, of course, information on the carbon challenge, uh, which is um, in conjunction with International Federation of Healthcare Engineering um, and the IFHE Carbon Awards. So I invite you all to, to check it out and to dive in. Um, at each, each one of these sections, there's a comment um, and um, comment section at the bottom, and that's where the discussions will happen for each of these. So jump in, and uh, if you see a comment you may want to disagree with or uh, learn more about, you can reply. Um, we do have notifications set up via email, so uh, if there is new content or new topics, um, you can uh, be notified, uh, and you can adjust that that in your in your profile as well, so in case you don't want. Um, a lot of emails. Um, there's some other great strategies here as well, but uh, I'll let you guys dive in and um, let us know what you think. Great. Austin, thank you so much for, for highlighting that. Uh, again, Decarb Healthcare is a free uh, online tool that uh, is intended to get better over time and just to help uh, get your existing buildings towards decarbonization. 
Uh, if we were in a Zoom regular meeting, uh, we'd have the opportunity to all give a hand clap uh, for our panelists, uh, but I'm going to do that on behalf of the team. Uh, panelists, thank you so much for all of your uh, hard work and for uh, trying to bust these myths. Uh, we have about eight minutes for questions. Uh, the panelists have answered many of the questions you've posed uh, in writing. Please keep submitting questions. Uh, we're going to take the ones that haven't been answered in writing yet to start. I may have a question or two if none others come up. Uh, and then if the panelists want to highlight any that have already been answered in writing, please do. Um, so someone asked, how can heat recovery chillers be applied to an existing hospital that utilizes high temperature hot water for reheat and perimeter heat, as well as steam for air handling preheat? Uh, Jim, we're going to turn that over to you uh, and keep your answer to less than an hour. <laughs> um, so there, I, I tend to think of heat pumps as maxing out at around 140, 150, and that has sort of been true. Uh, but there are new heat pumps being developed all the time, and there are heat pumps available today that can get you up to higher temperatures. But the other thing I would say is what I, I, I taught was taught years ago to design for 180 to 200 degrees hot water for systems everywhere. And what we've found is they're way over designed. They don't need to be anywhere near uh, that temperature. Um, probably there are some coils that need that temperature and many that don't. So some experimentation could help you reduce the, the temperature. And if you end up having to replace some coils in order to operate at a lower temperature, that would still be a, a pretty big step uh, in the right direction while we wait for the technology to sort of catch up. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, panelists, any uh, questions that you typed an answer to that you'd like to, to highlight out loud? I think there's there's a question about um, you know new construction and existing buildings and the relative impact yes. of both. And I think that's a fantastic thing to point out that existing buildings represent the lion's share of the um, energy and emissions. Um, and we've addressed that in some places. And I think the DCARB healthcare website does a really excellent job of addressing existing buildings as well as new construction. I also, you know, I always put my my hat on thinking about new construction is still really important because the new buildings that are coming online, the minute they're open, they're existing buildings. So getting it right now is really important so that that asset will be running for 50 to 100 years, hopefully. And so we want to open it in a way that is leading to those 50 to 100 year goals. So I don't know if either of you want to talk more about existing buildings, but I, I always want to like rally for the new construction too, to make sure we're not just repeating the same mistakes that we made in the existing buildings that we have. Yeah, I, I would say that the first step is stop digging the hole any deeper, right? The, the hole's plenty deep enough. Let, let's stop digging. Um, but yes, and that's part of why I compared uh, heat pumps to steam boilers, 80% efficient boilers. One of the questions in the, in the, uh, chat was the uh, the use of a condensing hot water boiler. And yes, a condensing hot water boiler is an improvement over a steam boiler, but it's only a 10, 15% improvement versus uh, cutting in half or cutting to a third kind of improvement that you get with uh, with heat pumps. And, and just to add to that, the, when you're actually doing heat recovery, where you're actually using the cooling, the, the math works out way better than when it's just a straight, straight up heat pump. I took the, the just the straight up heat pump approach, but there are challenges. I, I I don't want to make it sound like this is easy. Existing buildings that were built around a steam infrastructure, if you're going to convert to a hot water infrastructure, it's there's a lot of piping involved. There's a lot of intrusive work involved uh, to route that piping. It's not a trivial thing, and uh, the the thing I would argue is don't wait. Start thinking about it now. Start planning how you're going to do that. Do it. If you wait until your boiler fails, you're not going to have time to do anything other than buy another boiler and lock in another 30 or more years of carbon emissions. 
So plan now, start building that infrastructure, or at least know how you're going to, and start moving in that direction. Don't waste your capital improvement dollars on digging that hole. Um, Troy, I, I, I want to sort of reiterate something that um, I, I talked about in the, I typed a uh, an answer to somebody. One of the questions was, well, Jim, it is true that a hosp an all-electric hospital is only drawing maybe six, seven kW um, per square foot, and we're already designing to somewhere between 15 and 25, but we designed to 15 and 20 between 15 and 25 because the codes force us to do that. And so if we start moving things onto the electrical system, that that is only going to make the problem worse. Because if our codes require us to oversize systems and we put more on, we're just going to have even bigger, more oversized systems. And how do we deal with that? And my really serious plea to this audience. Uh, is to help the code writers fix this problem. Um, we are in the uh, public comment period, uh, or soon will be for the National Electrical Code. Uh, proposals were submitted by me to uh, permit electrical engineers to use historical data, prudent demand factors to size um, electrical systems. And the committee said, well, We'll let you do it for emergency power, but we won't let you do it for normal power for reasons that are completely, be well, I'll tell you, the main reason they said was we've been doing it this way for 40 years. Why do we need to change? And so the code panel needs to hear from us. Um, the code panel needs to hear that this is an issue. It's an issue now, and we need them to fix it. So um, please, if you uh, if you can, participate in the process. Uh, because you you have the power to make a difference um, and to make things better. So please take advantage of that power. I think that is an excellent note to end on. Uh, there is one question that's being answered uh, right now uh, in writing by Jim and Heather. So I'll leave this lo open long enough for them to answer. I'd just like to once again thank our panelists. I'd like to thank Jenna Beth Ferguson and the Healthcare Facilities Symposium uh, and Expo. Uh, for their leadership uh, and uh, for partnering to put this uh, event together. Uh, we do hope uh, that you've learned a lot and uh, that we've begun to normalize and socialize the idea of electrification uh, in healthcare. No, it is not necessarily easy, as Jim pointed out, but it is possible. Uh, and decarbhealthcare.com is meant to be a resource that you can use that might help along the journey. With the resources that are on there now, uh, and with the resources that we can develop as we share our questions and answers in that format. I'd just like to thank once again, all of you for participating uh, and to continue to take this journey along healthcare decarbonization. Uh, we're excited for what you are continuing to do in this space. Thanks everybody, take care.